What's good, everyone? My name is Chase Leto, and you're listening to Kinda Sorta Brown with University of Chicago's Public Policy Podcast. What up, what up, what up, listeners? It's your boy, John. And your girl, Dinah. And you are listening to Kind of Sweater Brown with the UChicago Harris School of Public Policy podcast. We hope you guys are doing super, super well on this fine day. It's Sunday right now. Don't know what day you're listening to this. But yeah, how are you doing, Dinah? Well, you know me. I School is tough. Okay, school is hard. Um, on top of that, you know, with the elections and all the presidential and vice presidential debates going on, Trump catching COVID, all of this stuff just happening around us, you know, it's 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 crazy hectic times, but you know, we, we're attempting to pull through. Uh, what about you, John? I totally agree. Getting back into the swing of fall quarter um, has been interesting, especially with everything, like you said, going on in the news, Trump getting COVID, that's wild. Um, <laughs> Poetic justice, if you ask me, but... And then the (laughs) presidential debates, it's all been super, super wild. But we've been out here, we've been doing our thing. So yeah, it's been pretty good. Yeah, and you know, speaking of a lot going on in the world, of course, we know that since the summer, we have had many protests going on, fighting for the movement towards Black lives. And that's what we want to spend this episode talking about, okay? So the title of this episode is The Black Reckoning. And we are going to try to make a case for rioting. Now, we know that rioting usually has a bad connotation to it, especially with rhetoric used from our current presidential administration. But it has also been the action that has propelled Black people forward for centuries. So today we're going to be discussing its historical implications. We're going to answer why do we riot? And we're going to take a look at how present day riots and protests are paving the way for a tangible future for Black people. So I'm excited, John. I know we're going to have a lot to discuss. We have some amazing guests joining us later in the episode. Yes, Let's I dig am super into excited to dive the Melanin Archive. I'm super excited to have a combo because it's super important and it's something that needs to be discussed. Welcome to the Melanin Archives. To open up, I'm going to start with an old Chicago newspaper headline that reads, 300 armed Negroes gather, new rioting starts, militia next. And this was a headline covering a riot that has started because sometime during 1919, there are a lot of racial tensions after the First World War against a lot of different groups, especially in regards to economic opportunity that remained after the war. And it all came to a head when a black boy swam into a segregated beach area. He swam into the white area of a lake or a river. And he was stoned and killed by a white man and he drowned. Wow. So what happened next? Like, how did the community react? Of course, the Black community was inflamed. It was an injustice, so they mobilized. And it's very interesting how the newspaper only characterizes the Black community as being violent. They use the word armed because, one, most of the violence was done and incited by white against the Black community. But this just goes to show how, quote-unquote, rioting is very loaded and racialized. And we will get into that later on into the KST when we discuss the protests surrounding the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Jacob Blake. Yeah, I think what you said was really interesting because what John is talking about right now is the race riots that happened in 1919. And we can spend forever diving into history, just the history of Chicago and looking back at the what they coined as riots that happened when something took place when a black person was killed, harmed in some sort of way and 
protesting occurred after. And I think what you said is really interesting how in the news article, painting black people as being armed, as being dangerous, um, as inciting violence, as being a disturbance to the peace, um, when in actuality, it wasn't peaceful to begin with. When that man, like you said, threw rocks at a black at a black boy who accidentally, you know, just swam a little too far into a de- designation. That black boy had no idea what he was doing, most likely. And that was the incitement of violence. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And KST. definitely, let's take it's a look deeper that. into how we see a lot of those same instances happening today. February 23rd, 2020. That was the day that Ahmaud Arbery was jogging in his own neighborhood in Glynn County, Georgia, and was fatally shot by two white men who thought that he was dangerous and a threat to their lives and to the white lives around them. March 13th, 2020. That was the day that police officers had a no-knock warrant and fatally shot Brianna Taylor eight times because they thought she was the suspect for some other crime. May 5th, 2020. George Floyd is killed by police. A knee to his neck. He couldn't breathe. And his death was recorded by a young girl who is now scarred from having witnessed something so terrifying. But this video has sparked now a world wide movement for black lives, a movement that started in 2013 after the death of Michael Brown. You see, here are the reoccurring stories of the death, the deaths of black people. And it's something that happens over and over. It's not a single isolated issue. It is something that spans over the lives of many Black people in America and abroad. And what's so devastating about a lot of these things is the fact that we have these video footage evidence, right? But still, where is the justice for a lot of these people? These are only the names of the people that we do know, you know, that have died by racial, the racial incidences of either white supremacists or the police, you know? And even if we look more at what has happened recently with Breonna Taylor's murderers being acquitted over and over and over again, that they are still working in the police force, right? Right. Where, where is their justice? And this is just of those who have died. There are many Black people who are continually, you know, facing injustices like this on a daily basis, whether it's being thrown in jail for long periods of time for either a crime they did not commit or a very minuscule crime, whether it's not having access to education by being able to go to whatever school they please because of the redlining that has been taking place. So why, when you ask why we riot, as that term has been coined, um, we do it truly for the lives 
of Black people, those who were no longer with us, and those who are still living, and to those who have yet to come. Right, John? I completely agree. I do it for my grandparents and my future grandchildren, but we shouldn't have to. The fight for Black lives has been going on for centuries. Why do we still have to demand equality? Why do we still have to make a case for ourselves against the state violence committed against the Black community for centuries upon centuries? And why do when we demand that equality, it has to be labeled as rioting and people who demand Black equality be labeled as rioters? Because if I recall, when I was learning about the colonizers who demanded equality from their mother country, Britain, they weren't labeled as rioters. They were held and praised as revolutionaries. We celebrated them in class. We wanted to talk about rioting today because there is a very problematic way in which rioting is being brought up in but, media but, 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 in but, but, relation but. to the fight for black lives. It's the brown breakdown. It's very racialized and it's very dismissive. We will get into that later in the brown breakdown. All right, everyone, welcome to The Brown Breakdown. Today, we have two amazing guests joining us. Um, first, we have Sequoia Ramirez. She is a freshman at Roosevelt University, and she has been an integral force in attending a lot of these protests, as well as um, organizing a couple of her own protests. Um, we also have Sydney Jackson. She is a student at the University of Chicago. She has really been out there every week. Like I've been looking at her Insta, organizing these protests, getting these groups out and about, making sure that people have been safe. Um, so we are very excited to have both of them on. Um, if y'all want to say hi. Hi. Hey, how y'all doing? Morning, everyone, or good afternoon, good evening, good night, whatever time it is, wherever you're listening. Sequoia, we'll ask you first. Um, what was, can you describe like a specific moment um, that really stuck with you while you were at one of these protests over the summer? Um, yeah, I always like to say that the moment that really stuck with me when I went to these protests was always my moment going to the protests rather than being the protest itself i feel like um once you've been to a couple of these protests you know what to expect you know what to expect from the police you know what to expect from everybody you kind of know the energy you're going to get when you're there um but i feel like a moment for me that was really memorable and a little hard for me was going to a protest and I, passing through um just congregations of a lot of non-black people and mostly white people sitting on their boats and drinking champagne, walking their dogs and just being so indifferent. Um, when like blocks away, there was a protest for innocent black death. You know what I'm saying? For the count countless time, this, this protest was specifically for George Floyd. Um, when the protest really started kicking off in the beginning of the summer. So I feel like that was a moment that was really memorable for me was just seeing how indifferent and how really it was a real visual of the indifference of people who are not black to black pain mm -hmm. and black death mm -hmm. so you so there was a protest happening right outside and like right next to it it was just these people who did yeah not so it was downtown right by the um the trump tower that's where we had been for a while by the trump tower and i was on my way from work and I parked really quick under a bridge um, right by, you know, one of those little ports where people can dock their boats and get on it and sail down um, the river, you know, where they, they dye the river green right there under that bridge right there. And it was, you know, little shops, people eating outside and a whole bunch of non-black and white people just on their boats, drinking champagne, walking their dogs, playing with their children, you know, and it just made me think of all the people who couldn't do that. It made me think of Tamir Rice, who couldn't just play in a, a playground, you know, and live life just carelessly. It just made me think about all the things we couldn't do. And they were just able to just 
completely disassociate with anything that is so traumatic that is happening to our community. And it was...